experience at all. Of this, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, I, to be fair, I think we've all been on a learning curve um, this year. I just feel very grateful that, um, yeah, I've, I guess we'll probably again talk about this later on, but I feel like I've been inadvertently preparing for 2020 for a long time in terms of a lot of the stuff that I've been doing. So hopefully, um, yeah, it, it helps to serve other people and their needs as well to learn those lessons. Hi everyone, Jeffrey Wang here and you're listening to the PDF Podcast. The Professional Development Forum, or PDF for short, was established to help diverse young professionals reach their potential in the Australian workplace. In this episode, we speak to Eddie Wu. As Australia's most famous teacher, Eddie Wu makes mathematics fun. He's a head math teacher at Cherry Brook High, the largest secondary school in New South Wales. With infectious enthusiasm, the father of three's unique approach to teaching has made math accessible to everyone. A brilliant student himself, Eddie would have excelled in any field, but in defiance of social conventions and his parents, he chose to pursue a career as a teacher. Eddie's YouTube channel, better known as WooTube, has more than a million subscribers with over 65 million views. In 2018, Eddie was recognized for his contribution to education, being named Australia's local hero. What a privilege to have you join me today, Eddie. <laughs> Jeff, uh, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me on. I'm sure you've heard this many times before, but I wish I had a teacher like you when I was at school. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it is, uh, you're right. Um, but at the same time, I, I hasten to remind you, and my students will tell you this themselves, that um, while I'm really glad to be able to shone the light on, you know, great classroom teaching practice that happens in schools every day, um, they'll be the first to remind you. They're like, yeah, Mr. Wu, he's a human being. He makes mistakes. He has terrible dad joke, you know, that's, that's all part of, you know, they have to deal with that stuff that gets cut out of the video they have to put up with. So, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm very flattered, but uh, at the same time, very keen to remind you, I'm only human. <laughs> well, look, uh, I, I, might, I might actually share a little anecdote. When I was thinking back in my school days, right, um, I actually had one of those teachers that really stuck in my head. And um, I really should pay tribute to my physics teacher at high school because his idea of how to teach us Newton's laws of motion is to bring a rifle to school. Now, he had a can <laughs> <laughs> sitting on an air track. He fired a bullet at the can and measured the speed of the can after it's been hit by a bullet. Now, based on the weight of the can and the weight of the bullet, then we worked out how fast a bullet was traveling when it left a nozzle of the rifle. So the fact that I can remember this today goes on to show just how important uh, the impact of a good teacher can actually have in our lives. So thank mm. you very much for serving in the, the noblest of professions. Uh, it is incredible. It is, you know, they say proverbially that uh, a teacher never knows where their influence and impact ends. And, you know, that example, uh, you know, to, to have that, um, to be so indelibly marked in someone's memory is an immense privilege for a teacher to be able to do things like that every single day. So I feel very fortunate that I get to, you know, interact with students and hopefully, um, I mean, I'm not going to be firing any weapons in my classroom, <laughs> um, but being able to give them lessons that they remember as well and that, in, you know, inform and shape them as people. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a massive privilege to have. Well, I'm sure they do. So... Now, um, in your Australia Day address, which I remember very um, fondly, now it's something you said really deeply resonated with me, right? You're telling the, this generation of kids that instead of following their passion, right? You, you, in fact, you're telling them not to follow their passion, you, instead to become passionate following the need. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you mean by that? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, this is a, it's a bit of a cliche, I suppose. Yeah, like follow your passion, which it's, it's just true enough to make it credible to people, um, but is also untrue enough, I think, to be destructive. And what I mean by that is, you know, yes, it is important that if we can, and I, I should point out, a lot of people do not necessarily have the opportunity to choose a vocation, choose a career where it's like, yeah, this is a thing I love doing every day. You know, what proportion, surely the vast majority, but what proportion of people out there, why do we do a job? Um, we do a job because we need to work to earn income to keep our family secure and look after them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, I think we all recognize that we can have the deepest impact on the communities we live in and the society that we find ourselves in if we really have a strong desire to, to make a difference and make an impact through our work. Um, and a, a lot of us, especially in a country like Australia, do have the opportunity to do work that matters. 
So that's why I think passion does matter. But following passion can be a terrible idea because I think about like what 17 year old me was passionate about was like playing my acoustic guitar and, and, you know, absorbing my life into video games. Like, you know, I, I don't think I would have made a very successful, you know, Twitch gamer or something like that. I'm no, I'm no PewDiePie. Um, and also <laughs> what would I be giving back to society if that's just simply what I followed? And, and so what I think is really important is that something that young people today are in some ways better in some ways worse at doing, is to recognize that the society they live in has needs that perfectly match up with the gifts and skills and opportunities that they have. And it might take work to understand how that alignment happens, but a time like now, you know, uh, a year of, of climate change affected bushfires or of, you know, the pandemic, which has just been wreaking havoc across our world, that is a time where it is, I think, abundantly clear that we shouldn't be thinking primarily about how will a career fulfill me? I think more importantly, it should be how can I serve the world that I live in through my career? So that's, that's why I think that dichotomy is a helpful way to think about it. Absolutely. And that is such an important message to impart with this generation, isn't it? So you started WooTube in order to allow one of your students who was very ill to participate in the class. And I also know that you lost your mother earlier on due to cancer. How has that experience shaped you as a person? I, I think there are some kinds of uh, things you go through, which, uh, you know, especially when you're younger and if they are, you know, deeply uh, traumatic or upsetting, they, you, you can never sort of get away from them. I know someone said to me once, you know, uh, there's this picture of um, a Japanese vase and it's in shattered and then it's been put back together, but you can see all the shatter marks still. And I think in many ways, um, anyone who goes through, through grief or trauma in any, in, in any kind of form, knows that yes there can be some form of, of moving on from that but you you always bear the scars and in many ways that actually can be a really powerful mechanism for doing good in the world and so for me in my context um, one of the things which I will never be able to leave behind and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing is that I deeply remember what it was like to be going through school and to have the burden of being a carer and of of wrestling with um, mortality and and serious disease and sickness that had a major impact on my learning and so as a person today number one um i, I deeply understand the importance of supporting people going through that um everyone i think we, we, you and i are both at the age where we know everyone is going through a struggle that you don't know about and so to be able to recognize that and also do something to support that is is vitally important um, and i think the other aspect is that i always think about my students um, as human beings first and as learners second. Uh, one of the best things that I learned from my teachers um, was that they, they cared for my human needs first um, before they really wanted to make sure that I had all that cognitive learning. Now, of course, they did do all that cognitive learning. I went to a very academically competitive school. Um, but, you know, the fact that they looked after me as a human being, um, cared for my needs, that was what enabled all the learning to actually happen. So those are things which every single day I'm in the classroom, I think are still a big part of my personality and character is what makes you such a wonderful teacher. So what, what about your faith? You spoke a little bit about your faith uh, in the Australia Day address as well. Um, did it play a role in, um, in, you know, how, how you, uh, in your philosophies in life and how you pursue your, your vocation? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I'm a Christian and that means a lot of things. I think there's a, a really strong push in our, our modern world um, to say that uh, religion is something which should be kept private. And in a sense, I understand the impulse behind that. Certainly when you have a look at history um, where there has not been a separation of um, church and state, there have been, of course, terrible abuses of power. Um, but at the same time, I think that it is... Um, it's artificial and impossible to try and draw a clean line between a human being um, and the convictions they have because of their faith and the, the secular work that they do. And I'll give you a really quick example. Um, when I think about my students, uh, I, I don't think it's ever right to give up on a student. Um, sure, I, I teach some, some students who are deeply troubled and have a lot of significant problems health-wise or socially or with their family at home and they go through a variety of different challenges. Um, but I never get to that moment where I say, well, you know what, at this point, just, just abandon hope. Just this, this person is, is, not a, is not worth our time anymore. They're just a waste of resources. Um, I, I think that that comes from my faith that I don't believe that because I think that 
you know, part of the Christian faith is that every human being is made in the image of God and is, is infinitely valuable. Now, of course, there are also secular reasons for that, for why we should not just suspend students willy-nilly and just expel them. And those are all fine justifications. Um, but I can't deny the fact that for me, uh, that response to students and that regard for their well-being that flows out of my faith. And that's something which I'm not ashamed of. Um, and it's a deep part of my, my personality and the way that I operate. Wow. So, which kind of explains this powerful quote that I heard f- from you once. Uh, you said that every child is gifted and I have the privilege of discovering how they're gifted. Well, it's so obvious to me that you absolutely love what you do and is great <laughs> at it. <laughs> so, but how do you keep up that level of energy just day in and day out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a really great question, actually. Um, it's funny, I'm very fortunate that I get to have the opportunity to speak to lots of different people. Um, and sometimes, you know, common questions will come up. I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. So you, you, you're, you're catching me off guard here. But I think that, uh, number one, um, there has to be a rationale for, for why we do things, right? So I, I think about our children, you know, you're, I, you, know, you, of course, as well, as, and a lot of your listeners, I'm sure, as parents know that we are capable or we have done things um, as parents that we probably, like, you know, childless selves in the past would have thought, that's impossible. You couldn't possibly have done that. You couldn't operate for a week or a month or several months on like three hours sleep. That's just impudent and impossible. You couldn't do that. Except then we did, right? Because suddenly we realized the buck stops with me. I'm the parent. I have this child. They're unwell or their needs are my responsibility. There's no passing on the buck to someone else. And so I guess, you know, when that comes to say, for example, me and my students, I remember once one of my, um, one of my supervising teachers who, when I was uh, uh, still at university learning to become a teacher and, you know, everyone's had this experience of seeing a student teacher walk into the room. They're young and fresh faced and have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> and uh, my, my supervising teacher, he said to me, um, look, I get it. I know you're inexperienced. I know this is your first time, but it's their only time. Um, and he was referring wow. to this huge weight of responsibility that you have when you're educating students that, you know, for example, just with mathematics, um, you, a single year of mathematics teaching can completely, um, you know, enliven someone's passion for the subject or absolutely destroy their confidence. Both of those pieces of power are in your hand. Uh, and not just as a mathematics teacher, it goes for every subject. And so I guess for me, knowing the stakes, that, that kind of is a really big part of the motivator to know, yes, these students are absolutely worth my time, my energy. Uh, and then the other thing is just to know um, the effects that you have on students when um, you can come to them and show them, like if I say to them, uh, if I come into the class and I am bored and disinterested and have no, um, no passion for teaching what I, um, what I want these students to learn, I think it'd be a fairly uh, a reasonable thing for the students to say to me, um, so you're bored. What hope am I supposed to have? Like you're the teacher, right? Um, you are the lead learner. I think we have to exemplify that. That's a leadership question as much as it's a, a teaching question, really. So um, when I know that's the impact of, of the, the demeanor and the attitude I bring to class, and uh, that's why it's really important. Every time before I walk into the room, before I unlock the door, I'm like, bring your A game. These students are depending on it. Wow. That is, that is exceptional. I'm, I'm always just blown away because, you know, every time I talk to you, you're the same person. <laughs> you, you literally <laughs> are the same person as those, that, that teacher in the videos. And I just get blown away how you have so much energy, so much passion. Um, you're, you're clearly very gifted. So, so kudos um, and hats <laughs> off to, to, to what you do. So now um, I, I want to ask you something a little bit more personal um, in terms of how you pursue the career, uh, sort of defying parents. As you know, I'm, I'm also of an Asian descent myself, and I know the kind of karmic hell you would expect when you defy your parental <laughs> expectations to uh, <laughs> become a teacher, not a doctor or, uh, or an engineer or an accountant. So h- how did you find the, cur- uh, the courage to actually do this? Yeah, it's funny that list you mentioned before. Um, I, one of my friends who I went to, I went through year 12 with, he said to me, my parents were very, they were very forgiving. You know, they said, you've got three options. You can be a doctor or a lawyer or a failure. It's, it's not that, <laughs> it's not that complicated, really. Um, so it, it is true. It's sort of, and I, I used to think this was um, just solely a, like an Asian background thing. And then I remember one of my friends at uni who was of a Hungarian descent. And he said, I remember describing him, you know, the, the trouble that I'd had with talking to my parents about pursuing a career in education. And he said, 
no nah, man that's just an immigrant thing right like he he himself was also second mm-hmm. generation and it's a it's a fairly understandable thing it's something easy to sympathize with like you know can you imagine I, I'm trying to wrap my head around what my parents are going through. They came to this country with very, very little, made immense sacrifices, lost so much of that, you know, community, social, family fabric that is so, you know, uh, so characterizes um, South and East Asian culture. They left that all behind. Why? For educational and professional opportunities for their children. So it is completely reasonable, I think, t- for them to have that expectation. Like, hey, man, we came here so you could have comfort, so you could have opportunities, not so you could take on some kind of humble thing. And I even look at my own kids who are in primary school age, and I can think about the fact that, like, I look at them, and I'm like, I know better than you. Of course I know better than you. I'm the parent. And to think that in, in, you know, 10 to 11 years, I will be staring down the same challenges that my parents did when I wanted to make those decisions, of course they would have looked at me and said, I know better than you. What are you thinking? Like, are you bananas trying to go for this kind of choice when you could have these other options? And I guess for me, um, that was something to wrestle with. Um, I think that I was really grateful for um, people who said to me, number one, um, you will be the person who has to live with the consequences of your decisions, right? You're going to be the one who's going to be doing that nine to five, you know, 40 weeks a year or whatever it happens to be, um, to be in the classroom 40 weeks a year, by the way, I, I sort of thought to myself, you know, I had friends who were like, I'm going into it for the holidays, right? Uh, and someone <laughs> said to me, actually, the reason we do, we do that is because, um, you know, teachers often do all this work outside of what most people think happens within school hours, within the school term. They said, man, we fit 52 weeks of work into 40 weeks. And so that's how we kind of operate, right? Um, but I guess, you know, pairing that idea that, I, you know, I, only I will be able to um, deal with the ramifications of my choice of career in the future. So I've got to be content with it. Um, but also I had people who pushed me and said, hey, what, what are you really good at? And what, what do you have the opportunity to change in the world? Um, you know, for example, something that I know I've talked to you about before is that I wasn't originally going to become a maths teacher. Um, but the fact that there's a need there, right? It's like, okay, I, I can do something instrumental to serve um, a real, you know, severe problem in society. I can address that. So why wouldn't I? Um, and then the final piece of the puzzle is to realize my parents had very good natural desires for me. I think they wanted me to be financially secure and to have um, stability in, in, in the work that I do. And it's been kind of amazing, you know, going through the GFC, you know, of whatever, 13 years ago now, um, and then having now gone through this global pandemic and I have one of the most stable jobs on the planet. And so to have, it's kind of like, well, who's laughing now, right? So I feel as though um, the the core desire that my parents had for me, which then came forward in, we want you to have this kind of career. um, I think I honored that, just maybe not in the way that they necessarily expected at the time. That's true. That's that's actually very true. But interestingly, I find that there's a bit of a cultural gap, right? So um, in Asia, you know, we, we... uh, I mean, our parents revere educators and scholars, you know, these people are held in very high esteem. Um, but for whatever reason, the, the profession of teaching is, doesn't seem to be held in high esteem in Australia. You know, I kind of wonder why is it that we have this culture here, right? And, um, you know, I, I don't understand that discrepancy. And, and almost because of that, your parents then, you know, thought that becoming a teacher isn't, you know, something that is desirable because they've sacrificed so much as, as uh, migrants, right? So mm. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, why is there a culture where educators aren't held up in the regard that they deserve? Mm. I mean, that is, um, that is the $64 million question. Um, for what it's worth, I've definitely wrestled with that myself. It's always seemed to me a really strikingly counterproductive thing for any society to do um, than to have very low regard for the people who form the foundation for the entire workforce. Every other vocation out there is built on this, um, this basis of education, right? Um, and I've wrestled with this question for a while. I don't know if there is any one answer, but if I, like one of the things that I think has resonated with me most strongly and the, the more I work across Australia, the more I understand and am sort of exposed to other education systems around the world, particularly in the OECD. Um, I think one of the things that um, makes Australia stand out is we have this characteristically 
um, sort of irreverent attitude toward authority. It's part of what makes us, you know, innovative. You know, we're quite willing to um, shatter sacred cows and say, well, who, who cares if we did it that way? Why don't we try something new and be, be a little innovative? It's part of why Silicon Valley is just swarming with Australians because we have that willingness to say, well, you know what? That's the way we always did it, but that can get stuffed. I want to try something new, right? <laughs> um, but but I, then, I then think that has this, um, this carry-through effect, which is unfortunate, that when we have a look at education, which broadly speaking, how do we respond to that when we're younger? It is a source of authority, right? And you can very sharply contrast that with um, many of the cultures around the world that, that revere educators and also have great respect for tradition. Um, and that's, you know, you, the, the sort of lineup of um, cultures around the world and, and that correlation there is, is quite stark, I think. So in terms of how do we address that, that is the deeper challenge, um, but it certainly is part of what I think is, it's inherent to Australian culture. So we can't ignore that fact and we've got to tackle it head on. I agree. And I think as immigrants ourselves and as you know, immigrants from a culture that, re, that really values education, I think we're a big part of that solution. So potentially, you know, some of it is encouraging essentially our, our children to pursue this noble profession, right? Um, mm. I mean, now, now that we're part of this great nation, it's, it's incumbent upon us to give back as much as it is, you know, all, all, this, all, all the things that we've been given since we've been here. Absolutely. Um, yeah, which actually leads me to the next question around uh, your identity. So your Australian identity specifically, because I was quite moved by, um, again, your, your Australia Day speech where you spoke about being bullied as a kid while growing up. And, you know, you were made to feel like you never really fit in. Um, how much does being named that Australia's local hero in 2018, how much does that mean to you? How does it feel not just to be accepted, but to actually being, be held up as the definition of being Australian? Mm, wow. Um, I mean, to answer that question is really difficult. I think that maybe one of the best ways I could say it is that, you know, I'm, I'm a math teacher and one of the things that mathematicians love doing is, is quantifying things. It's like things that don't seem to have any numbers in them. Mathematicians will find a way to impose numbers <laughs> upon them and quantify them. Uh, they're all about that big data. But I think the, the best way that I can answer your question directly is to say, like, there's just no way to put a number or to quantify what, what that means. I, I remember, like, it's, it was a really emotional response. The, the day, um, Australia Day, so the day after that was announced, in, back in 2018, um, I was really delighted to be invited to um, the Premier of New South Wales. Um, she was hosting um, a big sort of community, like, it's Australia Day, it's a celebration of, of our culture and society, and came to this group of, like, three or 400 people in Western Sydney. And for them to just sort of embrace me with open arms was a really profound and moving experience that I've just never gotten over. And I had all these people come to me and this is, I learned a really important lesson here. Like, for example, there were some um, retired educators there, people who've been teaching, uh, who had been teaching longer than you and me have been alive. Um, and they've, they've made this their, their vocation and their calling. And, and they said, you know, to me, we are so glad that what you represent is finally the recognition of, of our work and our profession over decades that, that we, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, people never really appreciated what teachers mean. And my first response was, oh my gosh, like, who am I that you would say these things to me? <laughs> but then I realized, right, like, I, I, I meant what I said when I was there on the stage at Parliament House, me receiving that award really was not about me. It was about me as a representative of, like, when, when a sporting team wins a trophy and then the captain holds it up, the captain does not mean I earned this trophy alone. I, he means, I, or she means, I'm holding this up, representing what the, all of us, you know, not just even the people in the field, the people, the support team, the fans just who, who have cheered us on. We're all in this together. And so um, it, it's, it was a very moving experience. Even when I think about it now, it's kind of, you know, it gets me in the chest. And so <laughs> I, I just really hope that I can honor um, that recognition and share, share that with educators around the country. Wow. Look, you, you've got such strongly, deeply embedded values, you know, and you're just a natural leader in, in terms of how you think about these things, you know, and, and I can only imagine this is only the start. I, I think you, I, I think there are definitely much bigger things for you yet uh, in, in the public sphere. So now this is uh, something I, I've been meaning to ask you um, because my, I've got a gut feel. <clears throat> so contrary to popular opinion and the typical Asian stereotypes, <laughs> I've got a theory that uh, you're not actually naturally gifted in maths. Is that correct? 
Well, what, what what gave me away, Jeff? I um, it's it's true, it's true. If you if you had asked my friends at school, um, you know, oh, who, who's most likely to become a maths teacher, they literally would have named a hundred people before they got to me. Um, because when you have a look at like the rankings and who got prizes in the math competitions, that kind of thing, I I never rated, not even once, wasn't even close. Well, look, my, but, but here's the thing, right? My, my theory is that you, you're, you're someone who is a right brain person. So you, you love your English, you love uh, arts, history and performance, and you're, you're a hell of a speaker. Um, but you're doing a, uh, you're teaching what's typically uh, a subject that's typically taught by left brain people. Right, because most math teachers, would you say most, most math teachers to date would have been someone of a more analytical type, right? So potentially, my theory is that do you think that because of that, your uh, your style of teaching resonates really well because you're you're really appealing to the other half of the population that's been <laughs> underserved by the left brain math teachers? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, there's a lot to be said about um, kind of the the ability to sort of broadly categorize people as, as thinking more way one than the other. And obviously there's like a whole spectrum in between there. Um, but I think you really hit onto something. I remember once a um, good friend of mine at the school, um, he's head of English here actually at Trevor Technology High School. Um, one time he was watching part of a lesson that I was teaching. And when the lesson's finished, um, he, he said to me, Eddie, I'm going to give you the biggest compliment that I can think of, which is to say, I think you teach maths like an English teacher, which was a very self-serving way to say, you know, he was like, yeah, English teachers are the best. And, you know, you, you've just come up a little bit to our level. So like, don't go up to you, right? But I think you're onto something, right? Like I definitely think about mathematics um, from, a, like from a narrative standpoint. You know, I want, for example, when students come in, I want them to have a deep-seated motivation for wanting to do the hard intellectual work of learning the thing I'm about to teach them. And so part of the way I'll often do that is exactly the same way that a movie or a book grabs us. It, it presents us with a conflict, with a problem. And we want to know, we, we're stuck to our chairs for an hour or two saying, how are they going to solve this? How are they going to crack this puzzle? This, this thing that got alluded, alluded to that I don't understand, but there must be some rationale for it. Um, I want to get to the bottom of that. Every human being is curious. And so I think that even with it, like I've watched bad movies and stayed in the movie theater because I wanted to know how it ended. Right. And that's a craft, like to be able to pique that curiosity. And that is very much, like you said, um, something that comes from that sort of humanities background that I love so much. So I, I, I think you're onto something there, Jeff. Well, I, my theory is that because of that, there needs to be more um, diversity of thinking, right? So it's not just a, a case of, you know, male or female, it's about how your brain is wired. So there, there probably is a case to be made that there needs to be more uh, right-brained math teachers in the world in order to better uh, connect that material to, you know, the naturally right-brained person. Oh, and congratulations on season two of your show, Teenage Boss, uh, as you know. On <laughs> thank the you, thank you. <laughs> My son, uh, Josh, loves the show. Uh, and I, I realized when I watched it with, uh, with him just how important it is to teach our children financial literacy. It's one of those things that is just as important at maths, but doesn't seem to be taught at schools. Um, mm. What do you think we should do um, to ensure that everyone has this financial literacy? Mm. I mean, I 100% agree. If there's one thing that the uh, Banking Royal Commission taught us, it's that people um, can be taken advantage of very easily when they just don't have that baseline understanding of how money works and how the economy works and all these kinds of things. So I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, it's, it's also tricky because as an educator, I know that there is this, um, there is this tension between um, what, what, is our, what is our job as teachers and, you know, is it to deliver a curriculum or is it to be social workers and psychologists and to understand the well-being needs of our children, which are very, very real and also very concerning. Um, and I think that's something which we have seen over the last 10 to 20 years, like long before I started um, as an educator, this trend had already begun of increasing social responsibility, sort of landing on schools, um, sort of in, you know, inverse proportion to how much sort of family structures throughout Western society in particular have really started to, to, to sort of crumble and weaken. And so that's, there's broader societal concerns there that I, that I think factor into that. Um, and I guess, you know, when it comes to say financial literacy, I think this was something that was primarily in the past really learned 
in the home. It's kind of like, I, I, need, I want you, you know, son, daughter, to understand how we um, can make our family, family finances work, how that you can contribute to that by getting a job yourself and to interact with all of those things is something that tended to happen within that home environment and certainly doesn't happen as much anymore. So I think there's a role for schools to play in supporting that. But I think it's one of those ways where, you know, I know I remember being taught this when I'm um, being told this when I first arrived at primary school for my kids. Um, the teacher there, the principal, she said, you know, you are your child's first educator. And don't forget that. And don't abdicate that responsibility. Partner with us. There, there of course, you know, you don't necessarily know how to teach a kid, how to, you know, structure their grammar and all that kind of thing. But you have a really important role in helping your child love to read. That, that comes from you modeling that to them. And so I think that there's going to be a, a, a collaboration between parents and educators on how to learn those lessons and make sure that, you know, we as teachers provide that context and that knowledge, but also from home, when modeling good practice and asking those questions and putting our children in situations where we can say, hey, what have you learned about this? Um, can I put you in a, in a scenario where you can actually learn some of those practical skills of managing money, which is kind of what Teenage Boss is all about anyway. Which is absolutely brilliant. So, so the last question for me then, uh, our audience are generally young professionals from a diverse background. What advice uh, do you have for those just starting out in their careers, especially those who are considering to become educators themselves? Hmm. I am. Um, yeah. I, this is something which I always wrestle with because when I work with um, you know year twelve students in particular, and they're asking questions like this, um, I think to myself, man, it is it is very hard to give like blanket advice. I want to have an individual conversation with every single person to say, tell me what makes you tick. Tell me what it is that drives you and motivates you in the world. And then, and then we can work out something for you. Um, but I think there is one thing which I've consistently learned, I, I say over and over again, so maybe it'll be useful to listeners, um, which is to really make sure that we, number one, cast our net wide in terms of, especially in a society like Australia's, um, we have so many great opportunities. And I think it's a mistake to lock ourselves in too early. Um, I remember some of my friends when we were heading into uni, we kind of viewed it as like, well, that's it. I've chosen my degree. This is just the job I'm going to get out of uh, after I finish uh, university three or four years or five. Um, and then I'm just going to do my job for 40 years until I, you know, kick the bucket, which is obviously a very sad and narrow way of looking at things. And when I think about the opportunities I've been very fortunate um, and, and thankful to have and experience, a lot of them have, co have come from openness. You know, it's, I never, I never thought I would write a book. That was not what I, I didn't get a, didn't study to do that. But when the, opportunity was presented to me and the work was presented to me to try this out, I thought this is an opportunity to make a difference on how wider society thinks about this subject that I teach. I'm going to try it. I might terribly fail, but you'll never find out unless you give it a go. And so I think that that's, that's really vital. Um, and then what goes with that? Um, it's something I, I can't remember who gave the quote. It might be Benjamin Franklin, but a lot of things get attributed to Benjamin Franklin. Um, I think he said, um, people often miss opportunity. Um, because when it knocks at the door, um, it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work. Um, and, you know, what I, what I just gave you that example of the book before, right? Like they said to me, you're going to have to w write 40,000 words. And I think I just like, I had to pick my drawer up off the floor because I was like, man, I had died when I was trying to do 5,000 words at uni. How can I come up with 40,000 words? Um, there was a lot of work, of course. It took me like two years to write that book. But um, the doors that it's opened and the way that it's helped people has been amazing. So um, I think it's important that young people don't shy away from that. And as young professionals, some of the most important work you will do will be the hardest. So I hope they embrace that. That is brilliant. Thank you very much. Look, I feel like every time I talk to you, I managed to learn, come away learning <laughs> just that much more. So I suppose it's, it's a hazard of your profession. You can't help but teach people. But uh, <laughs> thank you for being so generous with your time and, and your wisdom. Uh, and we look forward to having you speak to a, a future live audience at uh, PDF when, uh, when we can, when this pandemic ends. <laughs> 100% Jeff thank you so much for your time and uh, thanks for being so sharp and really challenging me I, I think I've learned a few things myself too so I hope your listeners enjoy brilliant thank you